I'll bet most of the people who watch this show use a font every day. They don't really think about it, and they definitely don't think about where it came from. But Brian Patoyo is a type nerd, and it's really all he thinks about. He's going to take us on a secret history of fonts. Enjoy! Ignite is an ongoing series of speedy presentations. They've ranged from building multi-person pogo sticks to hacking chocolate. Any topic that geeks hold dear. Each speaker gets only 5 minutes, and 20 slides that auto-advance every 15 seconds. The talk you're about to hear was recorded live at one of the featured Ignite events around the world. Hello, my name is Bram Batoyo. I'm at Bram Batoyo on Twitter, and I am an official type nerd. Today, I will present to you the secret history of fonts that you may not known before hot life kerning action included for all of you type geeks out there. Do you know that Gutenberg was one sneaky emulator when uh, uh, the uh, letter form was uh, first uh, got into the machine, you know, the uh, letterpress machine, it was originally invented to emulate handwriting perfectly. Now, uh, for this reason, because, you know, we handwrite very, very, uh, in, in, in a very free form manner. So the first letter forms on uh, printed matter actually contains a lot of A's and a lot of B's and C's and so on and so forth to emulate alphabets exactly like that. The current letter forms that we have on your right, which is very regular, uh, during the first years of letter forms were deemed to cause people to go blind because people aren't used to it. So that's, you know, that's sort of very strange because people are used to what they see on the left. Fact number two, all your Garamond are belong to us. Uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, type designer, really the first punch cutter in the world, uh, named Claude Garamond. He's from French, very famous. His type got so famous that it, uh, that it got revived over and over and over again. On your right is 17 different revival of Garamond. You may have seen it on your computer, Adobe Garamond, Monotype Garamond, Linotype Garamond, etc., etc. Now, what all of us may not know, might, may not know is that uh, it, not until the 1950s did someone named Beatrice Ward identify that Actually, what they call Garamond is really the type of Jean Janin on the left. So Jean Janin lived 40 years after Garamond, and for the longest time, people don't know that their Garamond is really not a Garamond. Now, fact number three that you also may not know is that the Declaration of Independence is printed with type from England. Now, Ben Franklin was one of the guys that, you know, that printed it. And uh, uh, the type was named Caslon after its creator. William Casson, the guy on the top, Ben Franklin's the bottom, obviously. And Ben Franklin loved the type so much that he sort of coined uh, the phrase, when in doubt, use Caslon. And that still rings through today because, you know, Casson is so, it's so versatile and it's a workhorse. Now, the next type is that, you know, Ben Franklin also liked the work of another typographer uh, named um, John Baskerfield. For the longest time, John Baskerfield had an affair uh, with a lady named Sarah Eves. Uh, you know, for about 30 years. So when John Baskerville's type got uh, revived on the late 90s by the lady named uh, Zuzana Lichko on the bottom, uh, she carefully named the type Mrs. Eves. So when you see the type named Mrs. Eves, that's John Baskerville's mistress, basically. So what you may not know is San Sarov is very, very old. So the year is Victorian England, and printing got very, very fancy, and people started experimenting with type. One of the experiments they did was they take a serif type and they cut all the serifs off, right? It's called sans serif, it's without serifs, but people back then call it grotesque because indeed, it's very grotesque to sort of cut your hands and feet off, it's grotesque to cut, you know, feet from serifs off. And so this grotesque type form kind of took off. Uh, it got very popular in German and in Swiss. The latest uh, iteration is called Die New Haas Grotesque. It's a, it's a German and next, I'll give this t-shirt away for free if anyone can guess what the new house grotesque was named after. Okay, you're right, it is Helvetica. So this is a Helvetica shirt, this is for you. So, you know, there's this whole deal about Helvetica and of course now we have to say something about Ariel. So where does Ariel came from really? So uh, late, 90, late 80s and early 90s, uh, my Apple licensed Helvetica to use in its every computer system. They bought it from Linotype. They had to pay for every copy. But Microsoft says, you know, we want to license something similar, right? Uh, of course, you know, we don't have all the money in the world to pay it. So they called Monotype and say, hey, 
can you design something that's very similar? So Ariel is in light blue, Helvetica is in, uh, in, 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 in white, and you see how they're very similarly set, and indeed on paper, if you set Ariel and Helvetica side by side, they will look very, very similar. Uh, still, Ariel is technically so, you know, considered a ripoff and sort of Helvetica's bastard child, right? So when you can, use Helvetica. Last fact is that Comic Sans is really born out of Microsoft Bob. Remember Microsoft Bob? It was you know, kind of disastrous. Exactly. It was created for that purpose, and it should remain that way. <laughs> My name is Bram Patayo, and I do a series called Type ID, and I hope that's helpful. Thank you.